welcome to Understanding the Basics of the H-2A Temporary Agricultural Worker Program. My name is Jackie Schweikler, and I'm a staff attorney here with the Penn State Center for Agricultural and Shale Law. The Understanding Agricultural Law Education Series is a course designed to provide subject matter literacy and competence on fundamental issues of agricultural law to attorneys and business advisors who work with or represent agricultural or rural clients, but who may not necessarily specialize in agricultural law. This series is wholly sponsored by the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture's Ag Business Development Center, established through the 2019 Pennsylvania Farm Bill. The Ag Business Development Center aims to enhance the long-term viability of Pennsylvania farms by supporting farm transitions, both from generation to generation and from conventional to organic farming, supporting big beginning farmers, providing risk management education, and providing financial assistance through low interest loans and grants. Uh, as you can see, we've covered numerous topics so far, including ag labor and the Fair Labor Standards Act, ag cooperatives, finance, and the farm credit system, crop insurance, conservation programs, and Pennsylvania's clean and green program, and then relevant to this program, uh, understanding the basics of landowner immunity statutes. You can also find materials and recordings from all these webinars on our Understanding Agricultural Law landing page on our website at aglaw.psu.edu. We are very excited to announce our upcoming Pennsylvania Agricultural Law Symposium on September 19th, 2024. That event is going to be in person at University Park in Penn State Law at the Katz Building from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. that day. We are going to have six CLE credits, five uh, substantive and one ethics credit, which is exciting. Uh, topics include the 2023 to 2024 Ag Law Year in Review. We're going to do a legal landscape of land application, biosolids, and food processing waste. Agricultural cooperatives, uh, is everything old new again? Uh, car carbon credits and contracts, common and uncommon provisions, then using farm labor contractors uh, contractors for domestic and H-2A workers, and lastly, uh, conflicts and ethical issues in fa farm family representation. Uh, so don't wait. Go ahead and register. You can register on our website. I will put a link to that in the chat as well. Uh, seating is limited, so please register uh, soon, and we'll see you there. We also have programming planned throughout the fall for our Understanding the Basics of Agricultural Law series. So in September, we'll present Understanding the Basics of Pennsylvania Food Establishments and Cottage Food Regulations. Then later in October, we'll have Understanding the Basics of Right to Repair Laws. In November, we'll have Understanding the Basics of Animal Disease Control and Quarantines. And in December, we'll present a program on child labor, Understanding the Basics of Children, Minors, and Farm Work. These are all on Fridays, they're all at noon, uh, Eastern time, and registration is up and available for all of them on the events page of our website. And finally, just a few reminders before I turn the webinar over. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. If you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A feature and I will collect those and uh, ask them at the end. Also, we encourage you to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, please tell us what you liked, where we can improve, and what topics you would like to see in the future. And if you would like us to submit this program for a free CLE to the Pennsylvania CLE Board or send you an attendance certificate that you can submit to your state's CLE Board, uh, we, we, we will post a link to the CLE form in the chat. Uh, you need to fill out this form to get your credits for the CLE. And as part of our responsibility to ensure attendance, we will provide a code word later in the program that you must enter into the form. All right, so Audrey is a staff attorney here with the Penn State Center for Agricultural and Shale Law and serves as the program director of the Understanding Agricultural Law Education Series. She is the primary author of the Agricultural Law Weekly Review and has most recently presented research on the Fair Labor Standards Act. Audrey, the screen is yours. All right, thanks, Jackie. Let's talk about the basics of the H-2A Temporary Agricultural Worker Program. Um, and I think Jackie's gonna get those links in the chat here, so if anyone was uh, interested in that for the CLE form. Um, all right, so I normally don't do this, but for this one, I, I feel like I want to, um, or I feel like I need to um, do kind of an overview of this presentation. So we're gonna start with the statutory language undergirding this program, and we're gonna begin talking about the certification process, but then we're gonna veer off real quick and talk about employer obligations under um, 
under H2A. And we'll also talk about the AEWR, tell you what that is if you don't know. Um, and then we'll go back to the certification process. And then if we have time, we'll talk about uh, maybe some cases and some data. So, okay. So what is the H2A Temporary Agricultural Worker Program? In a nutshell, it is, um, it allows agricultural employers to solicit and sponsor foreign workers to work in temporary positions for a limited amount of time. That is very cursory and there are several caveats and we'll get into them. So let's start with the statute. Um, so the Immigration and Nationality Act was amended in 1986 by the Immigration Reform and Control Act. That amendment established a non-immigrant visa classification for a worker, quote, having a residence in a foreign country which he has no intention of abandoning who is coming temporarily to the United States to perform agricultural labor or services of a temporary or seasonal nature. And here's our primary statutory language. Um, you can see in the middle uh, of that classification there, the statute includes four parameters to define agricultural labor. First, it's defined by the Secretary of Labor through regulation, not Secretary, not USDA, but the Secretary of Labor for this. Um, also Title 26, which is the Internal Revenue Code, Title 29, which is the Fair Labor Standards Act. And then um, the statute also specifies that the pressing of apples for cider on a farm is agricultural labor for the purposes of the statute. Um, I will also point out here that this section of the law is where the program gets its name. So if you see in the red, this provision is quite literally section H2A, US code section 1101, H15, H2A, there we go. Um, and you can see the next paragraph is H2B, which begins with the same language, but the work to be performed is other temporary service or labor. So it's it's a little more undefined. Um, according to the Department of Labor, the top H2B, sorry, H2B occupations in recent years have included landscaping, forestry and conservation, housekeeping, and meat packing. So there's still um, pretty labor intensive jobs, but just not agriculture specific. Um, H2A is agriculture specific. One of the biggest differences between the two classifications is that the H2B program is capped at 66,000 visas per fiscal year, and the H2A program is not capped. And so you can see here, um, if we look at visas issued, this is from 1992 or 2022, so 30 years. Um, H2A visas have more than tripled in the last decade or so. In 2012, there were about 65,000, and that has increased to almost 300,000 in 2022. So our top H2A states um, are kind of our, I don't want to call them the normal culprits, but Florida, Georgia, California, you know, big fruit and crop producing states. Uh, Florida by far has the most H2A visas with 44,700 in 2021 and almost 51,000 in 2022. And then Georgia and California are kind of battling for seven, second place there. I do think it's interesting. California had 32,000 visas in 2021 and then added more than 10,000 the next year to jump up to 43,760. That's a pretty big jump. I think it probably had something to do with COVID there. Um, but all the way down those two lists, the states are the same. Washington, North Carolina, Louisiana, Michigan, Arizona, Texas, and New York. These states... Uh, 10 states together comprise about 68% of all H-2A visas nationwide. And I just wanted to point out here that while Pennsylvania is not in the top H-2A visa list, it is in the top 10 for the H-2B visa list. Um, maybe a program on H-2B for Pennsylvania is in our future here. Um, I was informed earlier that this uh, tends to be used for dairy work here in our state. So um, I just thought it was interesting that we made that list. Okay, so back to the Immigration and Nationality Act. Um, this language creates our foundational criteria for H-2A workers. Foreign residents coming temporarily to the United States to perform agricultural labor of a temporary or seasonal nature, which highlights the last point I wanna make here with this underlying statutory language is that both the worker's presence and the job itself must be temporary for the H-2A classification. So permanent, year-round jobs are not eligible for this program. That does present a, a problem for dairy farmers uh, here in our state. Um, there is an exception for sheep and goat herding and range production of livestock. This is why you will see um, certain regulations using the terminology 
H2A non-range occupation. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that today, but just know that there is a, a special range classification under this H2A category. There are two other very important criteria for submitting a petition for H2A workers, and these are coming out of another section of the Immigration and Nationality Act, which states that for an employer to certify an H-2A position, there must be one, an insufficient domestic labor force. There are not sufficient workers who are able, willing, and qualified, and who will be available at the time and place needed to perform the labor or services involved in the petition, and the employment of the foreign labor will not adversely affect the wages and working conditions of similarly employed U.S. workers. So this statute sets up the certification criteria um, and some other criteria, criteria that employers need to demonstrate to meet and start the process of bringing an H-2A worker into the United States. Um, so taking a very big macro view, there's an overarching four-step process to bringing an H-2A worker into the United States. Um, and there's three main federal agencies involved in the process, the Department of Labor, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, and the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of State. So first in this process here, this kind of big, this is macro, um, a U.S. employer applies for labor certification from the Department of Labor, actually in Department of Labor's Employment and Training Administration's Office of Foreign Labor Certification, that is where the employer is going to demonstrate some of the statutory criteria. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, that the petition, that the position is temporary, that there are not sufficient U.S. workers, and that the incoming workers won't harm the wages. Then, if the Department of Labor grants the certification, the employer submits a petition to uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security. And then, if DHS approves the petition, the foreign worker can apply for a visa through the Department of State. And then if the Department of State issues the visa, the foreign worker may seek admission to the United States with the Department of Homeland Security through a port of entry. So if we look at that first big step one back here, so this guy here, um, the employer files for labor certification with Department of Labor. It is actually a multi-step process, kind of four big steps, but definitely could be more depending on if you don't meet and you have to kind of go back and redo some things. Um, this flow chart is from Department of Labor's um, ETA's H-2A page. It's also linked on the resource sheet, which I believe we have posted under the employer material section. Okay, so the very first step in this process is for an employer to file what's called a job order. And they would do that through Department of Labor's uh, Foreign Labor Application Gateway or FLAG system and also potentially separately with their state workforce agency. Because remember, they're trying to demonstrate um, insufficient workforce. So we need to advertise the job here. Um, in this job order, an employer will need to provide a complete listing of all of the tasks associated with the job or jobs that they are trying to fill. And they're gonna identify what's called an SOC code or a standard occupational classification that's coming out of the um, Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Um, they'll also say when the job begins and ends, the total hours for the job, the offered rate, and other information about the job. Um, because remember, like I said, the employer is trying to recruit U.S. workers. Um, so this step is beginning the documentation process to demonstrate their attempt to recruit domestic labor and then show that there are not sufficient workers to meet their need. And this is kind of where I want to jump ship and talk about some employer obligations. Because remember that statutory language is always undergirding this program and creates some obligations. So the first is US worker recruitment. Because in order to show that there are not sufficient US workers, employers must first try to obtain US workers. So before filing an H-2 a petition, and I do wanna specify petition, would be this big step two, that's your petition, um, an employer um, must do several things. They must contact former U.S. employees and invite them back for the upcoming season. They must hire all able, willing, and qualified applicants during their recruitment period for the job. Then they need to maintain a record of their recruitment activities, including 
what recruitment activities they did. Did they post the job? Um, anything else? And the date that they did it, the name and the contact information of the U.S. applicants, and then any referrals that they might receive, maybe from their state workforce agency or other employers or anybody, um, a record of their contact with each U.S. applicant and the outcome of each applicant, including an explanation of why that applicant was not hired if the producer does not hire them. So again, we're trying to show there are no willing, able, um, sufficient workers here. Another obligation that H-2A employers have is that they cannot give preferential treatment for H-2A workers. And here, I think it's um, relevant to talk about what a corresponding employee is um, in the H-2A program. So under the regulation, corresponding employees are any workers who are not H-2A workers by an employer who has an approved application for temporary employment certification um, in any work that's included in that job order or any ag work performed by the H-2A workers. Um, to qualify as a corresponding employment or to qualify as a, as a corresponding um, worker, the work must be performed during uh, the period of the job order, including any extension uh, period that might happen. So basically any U.S. workers who are hired um, would be corresponding employees there. And this is important because employers can't give preferential treatment to H-2A workers basically over their corresponding em employees. Um, the employer's job offer to U.S. workers must include at least the same benefits, wages, and working conditions offered to H-2A workers. The job may not impose restrictions or obligations on U.S. workers they're not imposed on H-2A workers. Um, the employer must provide employment to any qualified eligible U.S. worker who applies during the applicable recruitment period, um, which basically re reiterates the responsibility to hire, hire all willing, able, and qualified applicants during the recruitment period. Um, now, as part of recruiting, you may have noticed um, in the kind of the job order section, employers must post their offered rate of pay. And this is very important because if an employer anticipates seeking H-2A workers, that rate that they offer must be at least the highest of um, the federal or state minimum wage, the prevailing hourly rate or piece rate, um, any agreed upon collective bargaining wage, or what's called the adverse effect wage rate. So we'll go back to that language there in the statute, the employment um, of an alien cannot adversely affect the wages and working conditions. So the adverse effect wage rate is basically a special minimum wage for the H-2A program to ensure that the workers who are brought into the program do not adversely affect the wages and working conditions of similarly U.S. workers. It is updated yearly by the Department of um, Labor through regulation. I will come back to that. Um, and recently, the Department of Labor has changed its method of calculating this rate. Um, this is somewhat controversial. Uh, there has been a couple lawsuits filed. But, so the adverse effect age wage rate, AEWR, error, error, I've heard it called multiple things. It used to be comprised solely from data from USDA's Farm Labor Survey. Now, that is only looking at agricultural work. It's not looking at work off the farm for USDA. The new methodology, however, only uses USDA data for six uh, SOC or the standard occupational classification code and, um, and data. And then it uses data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Occupational Employment and Wage Statistics, OEWS, for all other H-2A occupations. So um, this is hearkening back to that job description and the job order that the employee submits as their first step. Um, this is a fairly significant change. Um, like I said, with that farm labor survey data, if you're only looking at agricultural work, typically that has produced a lower hourly wage across the nation. Part of that is, you know, if you look at our fundamental um, labor law in the United States, FLSA under FLSA, 
agricultural labor is exempt from minimum wage and overtime requirements. So if you are driving a truck on a farm, you are likely making less money than if you were driving a truck um, as, a, as a truck driver. Now, those are also potentially very different job descriptions, but we'll come back to that in a second. Um, okay, so there's, there's these six um, USDA-based uh, SOC codes, graders and sorters for ag products, agricultural equipment operators, farm workers and laborers for crops, nursery and greenhouse, farm workers, farm, ranch and aquacultural animals, packers and packager, packagers, and all other agricultural workers. H-2A jobs that tend to be subject to that OEWS-based wage um, construction workers, truck drivers, farm equipment mechanics, and farm supervisors and managers. So when an employer is putting together that job description, words, especially verbs, matter. And this is from Department of Labor's uh, 2024 Agricultural Seminar held March 28th, 2024. This is not publicly available, but I am using it here. So uh, they sent it to me and I thought it was really, really good. Um, so here, the presenter from Department of Labor was pointing out the difference um, when an employer is crafting their language or crafting how they're going to describe a job. If you say like direct or monitor seasonal workers, the Department of Labor presenter was using the term like team lead. Mm -hmm. This direct and monitor could become conflated with supervisor, depending on how you describe the position. Um, when I was listening to the webinar from Department of Labor, um, I really took away that, you know, if you're talking about a team lead position, someone who might direct other employees as to how to harvest the crops or how to uh, load them or something like that, it's really project oriented, it's really work oriented, as opposed to this supervisor position, which is very personnel oriented, um, planning work schedules, handling personnel manners, things like that. Um, when we look at things that could become a farm mechanic, then would be that OEWR, OEWS based wage, which is probably going to be a higher rate it is based off of um, a, a broader spectrum of work. Um, so if we look at just like the, the farm work job, this repair and maintain farm vehicles, the point of that would be to then to use the farm vehicles to do the farm work. Whereas over here, it seems like the, the brunt or the, the purpose of the work is to repair the truck, not necessarily to repair the truck so that they can then use the truck to harvest things, but to repair the truck. Um, and then it's also, this is much more complex, diagnosing, disassembling, overhauling versus repair and maintain. And then if we are just loading crops into trucks and driving them, you know, that seems to be falling more into kind of the um, duties that would be under farm work as opposed to heavy trucking, um, 13 ton capacity or semi truck, open roads, way stations, maintaining vehicle locks, coupling and uncoupling trailers, secure cargo. So I think if I think about these, these three descriptions here, the purpose, the end purpose of the work is different than here where the end purpose of the work is to continue doing the farm work. Um, okay, so that's just a, probably a little deeper than I should have gotten into there, but I just thought that was just a great, um, uh, material from that presentation I wanted to share with you. So um, we're talking about the adverse effect wage rate for 2024, um, published in the Federal Register, effective 20 January 1st. Um, we can see um, that it is much higher than the federal minimum wage of $7.25. Here on this map, you can see the lowest rate is $14.53 in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And then we've got our highest rates over on the West Coast there in California, it's 1975, and then 1925 in Oregon and Washington. And then here in Pennsylvania and the Mid-Atlantic states, we're at $17.20, along with Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. And then that raises up to $17.80 in 
in New York and farther north, and then uh, varies throughout the country. Uh, one more thing about the adverse effect wage rate, AEWR. Department of Labor very recently, um, on April 29th of this year, published a rule titled Improving Protections for Workers in Temporary Agricultural Employment in the United States. So in the last, what, year and a half, 18 months, we've had two pretty substantial, pretty significant rules passed um, regulating this program. I'm not going to dig into those because, man, there's a lot in there and I'm trying to stay basic. So if you don't know what this program is, we're going to kind of walk through what do employers need to do and what's this process look like. Um, a Department of Labor does have a great webinar, like an overview, and that is also linked in the resource sheet as well. Um, so this uh, this new rule has numerous provisions. Um, one of the things that it did for the AWR was to designate the effective date of each updated adverse effect wage rate as its date of publication. So as soon as it's published in the Federal Register, boom, it's effective. And then employers are required to pay the updated rate immediately upon the publication in the Federal Register. This rule has been challenged on June 10th, 17 state attorneys general filed suit in the US District Court for the Southern District of Georgia. Among their complaints are that the rule, um, which also protects collective bargaining activities, um, they're saying the rule is arbitrary and capricious and that the rule unlawfully gives certain rights to alien workers that are not enjoyed by Americans. That's kind of one of the thrusts of the, of the complaint. Um, it argues that H-2A visa holders are exempt from collective bargaining um, under National Labor Relations Act. So uh, we'll see where this goes. Department of Labor has yet to file a response, but if, right now this rule is effective. So back to employer wage requirements. Um, so H-2A employers must pay the highest of that federal or state minimum wage the prevailing hourly or piece rate, the agreed upon collective bargaining rate, and the adverse effect wage rate. Now, in practicality and practice, the adverse effect wage rate most likely is going to end up being the highest of those. However, um, if there is a prevailing piece rate, there's a recent unpublished opinion from the Ninth Circuit. So I know we're over on the West Coast when, when I'm talking about this, but um, that was ultimately was dealing with the inclusion of certain job rates in wage surveys for the AEWR, but the court there stated that when the prevailing wage is a piece rate, um, the INA requires that an H-2A employer offer it because such a wage is always at least the highest of the listed wages because a piece rate wage offers workers the opportunity to earn more than they might under an hourly wage. Um, it's important to note that if an employer is offering a piece rate under H-2A, the worker's final pay after the whole week or, or whatever must still at least equal the advertised hourly rate. So if they did not um, you know, pick enough uh, crops or whatever to, to get them up to that, um, probably it's gonna be the AWR, then the employer must um, supplement that. So um, in addition to paying certain wages, employers, under H-2A must also guarantee to offer the worker employment for a total number of work hours, at least three fourths of the work days of the total contract period. Um, so also H-2As just kind of as inside positions, the positions themselves must be temporary full-time positions, which Department of Labor defines as at least 35 hours a week. So an example that Department of Labor provided was an employer who offered a 10-week contract for six days per week at eight hours per day, which would be 480 hours. Um, under the three-fourths guarantee, the employer would be uh, required to provide and pay for at least 360 hours of work. Um, so what that is getting at, you know, sometimes maybe you, you get out in the field and crops aren't what you think they're going to be, or you hit, hit with weather, weather or um, so some other kind of issue like that where you, the employer is finding themselves, they do not need the labor that they thought they were going to need. They are still on the hook for paying at least three fourths of what they 
had contracted for. There are some exceptions here for impossibility of contract. There's also some allowances to transfer that worker in some instances, but I won't get down in the weeds of those. So, but generally the employer is on the hook for at least three fourths of the time that they had contracted for. Um, additionally, Department of Labor states that the worker may not be required to work for more than the, the number of hours specified in the job order for a work day or on the worker's day of religious observance or federal holidays so that the, so that the employer can meet the requirements of the three-fourths guarantee. The employer, however, may count all hours actually worked in calculating whether or not that three-fourths guarantee has been met. Okay, so under H-2A, employers are required to recruit U.S. workers, abstain from giving preferential treatment to H-2A workers over U.S. workers. They must pay at least the adverse effect wage rate or the highest of the four there and guarantee that they will provide and pay for at least three-fourths of the hours that they've advertised. Employers are also required to provide certain living benefits for H-2A workers, including the costs for the employees to get from their place of recruitment to the work site and then back, and then housing, meals, and certain transportation once they arrive. Let's talk about some of those. So um, the uh, inbound transportation, um, employees arriving, the employer must pay the worker for reasonable costs incurred by the worker for transportation and daily subsistence from the place um, from which they uh, from which they came to the the place of employment or from when where they were recruited. Um, the minimum daily subsistence payment must be at least as much as the daily meal charge. And I'm realizing right now I had switched these slides around, so I have information here. Um, you'll see this again, but the daily meal charge is $14. I'll come back to that. So that's the minimum daily subsistence payment right now under the regulations. Um, if it is the prevailing practice or if the employer had advanced costs to other H-2A employees, the employer must advance the transportation and subsistence costs to the worker before they get to the work site or while they are still um, in their home country. If the employer has not advanced the costs, employers must pay the cost by the time the worker has completed 50% of the work contract period. If the employer failed to do that, they would then be in violation of um, the program. Employers must also pay for outbound transportation. If the worker completes the contract period, the employer must either pay, uh, provide or pay for transportation and subsistence from their living quarters to their place of recruitment or you know, their home country. Um, or to their next employer, unless there's an agreement that that new employer will pay those transportation costs. The employer also must pay um, outbound transportation for any displaced H-2A workers. And so this is where, um, did I talk about the 50% rule? I thought I did. Well, I'll talk about it right now. Um, so with, with the recruiting obligation, um, from the time the foreign workers depart from the employer's uh, place of employment, the employer must provide, um, well, back up. So when that employer is filing that job order, they have to keep recruiting and they have to keep recruiting until 50% of the way through the time period that they're recruiting for. So if they were to get a US worker during that time who was willing and able and met all the qualifications after they have started the process of bringing an H-2A worker um, into the United States, then they would have to pay to send the H-2A worker either back or to another job site. Um, so that is where uh, you might have some displaced H-2A workers and, and employees would be responsible for transporting them uh, either back or to their next job. Employers also must provide housing for H-2A um, employees and to corresponding workers um, who are not reasonably able to return to their residence within the same day. So uh, there's a little caveat on that. Department of Labor says H-2A employers may house workers in temporary labor camps that they own or control 
or they may use rental or public accommodations like hotels or motels. The housing must um, be meet OSHA standards and local health and safety standards. And the more restrictive standard is probably gonna apply, which might be that local uh, or state standard. Um, I'll come back to this Pennsylvania versus Department of Labor thing. Um, DOL must certify the housing before the workers occupy it. And then the housing must be maintained through the workers' occupancy. In one of the webinars, uh, great webinars from Department of Labor that I watched, the presenter said, this is um, often a, a, an area of violation where you start off the season, everything's great. Um, and then a couple weeks in, uh, we got we got broken broken windows or broken uh, appliances. We, he said, you know, daisy chained um, electric cords. So um, it's, it's usually not, the certification at the beginning of the season, it's usually end of the season that becomes a problem. And uh, here is, so here's an example. Um, this is Department of Pennsylvania Department of Ag. And I just want to point out, so we've got the OSHA standards over here on the right, uh, and there's two for built after um, April 1980 or before, but the Pennsylvania for the sleeping rooms uh, requires that each occupant must be provided with a bed, mattress, and cover, pillow, and case, sheets, and blankets. Here, the OSHA just says provided with beds, cots, bunks, or beds, cots, bunks, clean mattress, clean and sanitary linen. So here we're specifying pillow and case, sheets. This is more specific. This is a little more narrow. This is what's going to control. And there's more. There's information on that too. Okay. Um, employers are also responsible for providing meals for H2A employees. Um, the employer either must provide each worker with three meals per day or must furnish free and convenient cooking and kitchen facilities to the workers that will enable the workers to prepare their own meals. Where the employer provides the meals, the job offer must state um, that if there's going to be a charge, if the employer is going to charge, if any, to the worker for such meals. Under the current regulations, like I mentioned before, an employer may charge workers up to $14 per day for providing them with three meals. Um, that amount is updated annually and pegged to the consumer price index. Uh, it's gonna come through in the federal, reg uh, federal register, federal, federal regulations there. However, employers can request to charge more. There's a process for that. There are also regulations prohibiting a third party meal provider or the employer from charging workers a meal cost that includes a profit, kickback, or other direct or indirect benefit to the employer, person affiliated with the employer, or other person. So you're not running a restaurant here, you're just trying to feed your employees. So the purpose of this is not to be making a profit from meals provided, it is simply to cover your costs and, um, and meet your obligations under the, the statute. Employers must also ensure safe food handling and storage, especially in the field, this was another um, issue that was pointed out by the Department of Labor presenter, um, you know, he, he made the comment that often they may leave at 5 a.m. with a with a lunch and then there's nowhere to refrigerate that lunch or nowhere to really keep it cool. You're out in the in the fields working. It's sweltering by noon. That food is spoiled, um, depending on what it is. So if an employer is providing um, so food safety, uh, food handling is uh, they must uh, follow. Um, regulations there and make sure that food is safe to eat. Um, and then also if an employer is providing facilities, they must ensure that there is clean space for food preparation and that cooking and refrigeration appliances and dishwashing facilities are available. While the regulations do not require specific cooking appliances, um, the appliances must be sufficient to allow workers to safely prepare three meals a day. Department of Labor states that this requirement is not met if the employer merely provides an electric hot plate, a microwave, or an outdoor community grill, or if workers are required to purchase cooking appliances or accessories like portable burners, charcoal, propane, or lighter fluid. Employers must also provide transportation between the provided housing and the work site at no cost to the worker. Transportation must comply with all applicable local, state, and federal laws. And then this also, um, 
the, uh, the new 2024 worker protection rule that I just mentioned earlier, that had a provision in it dealing with transportation. Um, and I'll just read you what Department of Labor says. They say, many H-2A workers travel in vans or buses, sometimes driven after long days by tired workers. Um, so the final rule now has a seatbelt requirement. And what it says is if the vehicle is required by Department of Transportation regulations to be manufactured with seatbelts, then the final rule prohibits the operation of those vehicles to transport workers under the H-2A program unless each occupant is wearing a seatbelt. If a vehicle is required by DOT to be manufactured, um, oh, sorry, I just, I just said that. So implicit in that rule is that if the vehicle is required by DOT to have seatbelts, it must have the correct number of working seatbelts. So employers can't pile 20 employees into a 10-person vehicle because there would not be enough seatbelts. Uh, employers also have an obligation to disclose to H-2A employees um, they are provide, uh, must provide a copy of the written work contract, which is also the certified job order. Um, if I have time at the end, I'll go back and show you um, in the system what this looks like. Um, so they, they must provide this copy of the written work contract in a language that the worker understands as necessary or reasonable. The written contract must be provided before the worker applies for the visa if they are out of the country or at the time of the job offer if they are in the country. So can't extend the job offer, wait till they get here and then go, oh, here's your contract. It's got to be before they get here and at the time of, or at the time of offer. So what must be disclosed in the contract? Basically everything we just talked about, um, job qualifications and requirements. So that job order, um, the job duties, that they get free and safe housing, um, that they have workers' compensation insurance. I didn't mention this, but employers must provide state minimum workers' compensation insurance. I also didn't mention the next thing, um, free tools, supplies, and equipment. And other um, employers must provide tools and equipment. They cannot require employees to pay for them. Um, they must disclose that the employees get meals or kitchen facilities. And, and then what that's going to be. So if they're going to charge the employee for a meal, they must state that. Um, inbound and outbound transportation payments that the employer must pay. Uh, the employer must tell the employees about this. Um, the employer must tell the employees that they get free and safe daily transportation. They must tell the employees about the three-fourths guarantee. Um, the, they must tell them how many hours that they're offering to, to work there or that the job would require, hours and earnings statements, the rate of pay, obviously, the frequency of pay. This is another thing that's in the regulations. Um, workers must be paid at least semi-monthly or more if the job offer, uh, order specifies. Uh, employers must disclose any deductions that they plan to take, um, meals, other deductions required by law, those are okay. Employers must specify them and they may not deduct for items not disclosed in the job order. That is, um, um, I don't think it was H-2A employer, uh, employees, but I want to say there was like an issue in Minnesota. I'm, I'm now, now I'm reaching, I don't have it right in front of me, but that's an area that can be tricky when employers start charging employees for um, clothes, tools, you know, whatever. Um, cashing checks can be an issue. It's a gray area. Um, so other, other disclosures, abandonment or termination of employment, what's going to happen there if the employee leaves, and then contract impossibility. I will note that in the Department of Labor presentations, this seemed to be functioning like common law contract impossibility where the intervening event, so we can't complete this contract because something crazy has happened, um, is truly unanticipated. So weather events really need to be unanticipated, like snow in Miami in July. Um, although, who knows, we'll see. Uh, and we compare that to I don't know, flooding in the Mississippi River Delta Basin. I'm from the St. Louis area in Southeast Missouri. Um, we get flooding. Uh, and I would also say, I think the DOL mentioned this, you know, if an employer carries insurance for the event, it's probably not unanticipated. I will also mention that employers and labor contractors, which I've not talked about here, are um, prohibited from charging employees fees as a condition of employment. 
And although that's not required to be disclosed, I don't think it's probably good practice to include that. And then like any good federal regulatory scheme, we've got a record keeping requirement. Um, employers need to keep records of all the efforts to comply with all of the obligations we've discussed, all the paperwork surrounding their H-2A certification and employment of H-2A workers. These are just a few. Um, feel free to go to those links to find more. Okay, so those are our uh, employee obligations or the, the ones I'm, I'm gonna talk about here. Um, I wanted to point out here, well, we'll go forward just a sec. So back to back to our big process overview, that Department of Labor first step. There are two um, agencies, Department of Agen Department of Labor agencies involved in, in this H2A process. And the first is um, EDA's Office of Foreign Labor Certification. I mentioned that before. That's gonna that's where you're applying for the certification. And then there's DOL Wage and Hour Division, and that is the enforcement arm of DOL. Um, probably most ag employers are very familiar with um, Wage and Hour Division. They're the ones who are going to come onto your property and look at your housing, interview your employees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so back to that process. Um, a lot of the employer obligations need to be demonstrated as a condition of H-2A certification in this step one. So let's go back to, I'm gonna try doing this here. I've got a fancy. So this cool uh, H-2A process, this is like a breakdown of that big step one. So, you know, we've got um, here, step one, file the job order 75 to 60 days before the first date of need with the state workforce agency. That's also gonna go um, into the flag system which would be through DOL as well. And then hopefully there wouldn't be any deficiencies. And then the state workforce agency would notify an employer that they have approved the job order and the state workforce agency would start interstate recruitment. And then at that point, we'll go over here, um, then the employer 25 days before the first date of need would file an H-2A application with the National Processing Center in Chicago. And then the National and get back to them within our within seven days, they will review. That's what they're saying. And then we'll go right here. And then hopefully they will send the and the job order on an electronic registry and then transmit the job order to additional state uh, workforce agencies or interstate clearance. And then we'll go over to step three, very important. The employer needs to still keep recruiting US workers, contact those former US workers, accept workers, and conduct any additional recruitment that the National Processing Center tells them they need to do. And then step four, complete that temporary labor certification process submit uh, the recruitment report, so demonstrate that you've been recruiting, submit proof of housing inspection, that your housing meets all the requirements, and workers' compensation. And then we'll go over here. So hopefully they, they do all that and they get there and then the National Processing Center would issue a final determination, hopefully they would issue certification. And then, love this, an invoice to pay the fees for the uh, for the H-2A certification. And congratulations, you are now ready to file with US uh, CIS or the Department of Homeland Security there. I think I also want to bring this out here. This important employer must accept referrals until 50% of the work contract period has elapsed. And so there's our step one. There's our big step one, and then they can go to DHS and submit that petition for H-2A. Um, so let's see, where am I at? Okay, 46. Okay, um, there are currently 86 countries that may send H-2A workers to the US. Um, this list is valid for one year from publication and DHS update, updates it periodically. And really the Secretary of Homeland Security seems to have pretty wide discretion as to which countries end up on this list. Some language from DHS says, the Secretary of Homeland Security may consider adding a country 
um, upon receiving a recommendation from the Department of State or a written request from an unlisted foreign government or an employer who would like to hire nationals of an unlisted country um, or other interested parties. So they'll consider it if you ask them. The country's co op uh, factors they include that the uh, DHS will consider is the country's cooperation with issuing travel documents for citizens, the number of orders of removal executed against citizens and residents of that country. So how easy or difficult is this country to deal with? Um, and then other factors that may serve the U.S. interest. Uh, DHS also says, if you want DHS to consider adding a country to the eligible country list, send a written request. Um, DHS may add a country whenever the Secretary of Homeland Security determines that the country is eligible. That's that's the qualifications. Um, and then also, just because a country is not on the list does not foreclose the possibility that someone from the country could gain U.S. entry under the H-2A program. There's also, um, DHS says, a national from a country not on the list may be the beneficiary of an approved H-2A position if the Secretary of Homeland Security determines that is in the U.S. interest for the national, uh, for national security to be the beneficiary of such a position. So basically, um, Secretary of Homeland Security has a lot of authority and jurisdiction, or a lot of discretion and authority in this area. Okay, cool. Wow. Yeah, I think that is it. That's all we have time for. Uh, we will be sending out a recording and additional materials. Let me know if you have any questions. And thank you, Audrey. This is great today. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye.